Welcome back, Pet Parent. I'm so happy you're, you're joining me today on the Pet Parenting Reset. Uh, if you're watching the video, my lighting is a little funky. It's it, it turned chilly today and it is pouring down rain. And so I'm using artificial lighting, <laughs> and, and which is not great for health or anything, but it is what it is. Have to have lighting. Um, but today, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things. I, I really enjoyed an episode we did. Uh, I think it was the last solo episode. I have plenty of interviews coming up for you, one of which is with Dr. Josie Bug. And she sent out an email not too long ago that is something that I have heard of, but hadn't really had a chance to kind of delve into. It is incredibly troubling. Uh, for me <laughs> as a pet parent, and it's something that you need to know about as a pet parent. So I want to talk about that with you and kind of unwrap that. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on The Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So let's get to Dr. Josie Bug. And if you're not familiar with her, that's okay. She's going to be on the show very soon. And we're going to get to hear directly from her uh, who she is and why you should listen to her. Uh, but she is an integrative holistic veterinarian. I'm just going to start reading this email from her because I, I don't want to dilute the message. And she says it so well. Here we go. I am a unicorn. Of course, this is Dr. Josie talking, just to be clear. I am a unicorn in the veterinary profession at this point. I am a solo practitioner making house calls. Yes, I read the James Harriet series, All Creatures Great and Small, in elementary school and decided that was what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I'm doing it, except instead of the countryside in Yorkshire, I am doing it in South Florida a wild and woolly melting pot of international cultures. I only see small animals, no calf pulling in the middle of the night, and I use acupuncture and herbal medicine as my top two treatment modalities. I will admit, as a small practice, um, it, it, it is a small practice, but over 22 years, I have built up a wonderful, dedicated clientele who trust me with their beloved pets and refer friends and family. I will often go several months to a year with a stable caseload, my schedule filled up. Then as patients improve or make their way across the threshold to the other world, there comes a time when I need to fill in the open spots. This past month has been one of those times. During the pandemic, I was hesitant to add new clients, so I was a bit overdue. I was effectively out of the loop of conventional veterinary medicine for the past couple of years. Leading up to the lockdown, I did have two cases that alerted me to a troubling new trend. Two of my geriatric patients, both small breed dogs, one 16 years of age and the other nearing 17, were taken to emergency clinics, one for constipation and the other for a first time seizure. Both received methadone at the emergency clinics and both dogs died from what appeared to be classic opioid overdoses, according to the medical records, respiratory depression, apnea, then cardiac depression, followed by a systole. What struck me was the use of methadone, a drug utilized nearly exclusively for the government funded heroin rehabilitation program. It is a potent opioid, long-acting, lasting 24 hours, and more addictive than heroin. In human medicine, an opiate equinologistic dosing charts, there are cautionary notes about using methadone. Caution. Methadone is appropriate for chronic stable pain in an 
opioid tolerant patient, but is usually avoided in opiate naive patients. Convert and titrate slowly over three to six days due to long biphasic half-life. Beware of cumulative effects in the first three to 10 days. That's from the UNC Healthcare Guidelines Opiate Equinogestic Dosing Chart, University of North Carolina Hospitals and Therapeutics Committee. Several questions came to mind. One, why is methadone being used in the first place? Who is recommending to ER veterinarians and why? Two, why is it being used in an older, frail patient with potentially compromised respiratory, cardiovascular, renal, and or hepatic systems? Three, why is a constipated dog administered opioids, which are known to cause constipation? Four, are the staff and doctors trained to monitor patients who are given high-potency opioids like methadone. Five, do the clinics have the reversal agent naloxone on hand and do they know how to use it effectively to prevent overdoses? And six, uh, and finally, are these high potency opioids, which can lead to respiratory depression and death, really necessary in the first place in many of these patients? I was so disturbed by the second case, I called the owner of the clinic to discuss the issue with her. It took some persistence on my part to reach her, and I was initially met with resistance and defensiveness. I eventually managed to talk to her and com communicate my valid concerns. Fast forward to 2022 when I began accepting new patients and in my practice. Interestingly, out of the seven new cases I have recently taken on, Five of them were prescribed or administered some version of what I am calling the new drug regimen. So what is the new drug regimen? The drugs involved have all been around for quite some time in human medicine, but they have only recently found their way to veterinary medicine. In the human world, many of them are now being flagged for side effects, either in lawsuit settlements or black box warnings by the FDA. Human patients are speaking out about addictive potential and, uh, of the meds and adverse mental health effects. Books are being written about them, movies made, and podcasts abound about the difficulties human are having while, humans are having while on many of these medications and the difficult withdrawal symptoms when attempting to stop taking them. So as I'm reading this, this is me talking again, Jessica, <laughs> um, as I'm reading this, I like the one thing that comes to mind more than anything is the limited series. I cannot remember if it's on Hulu or Prime, um, but it's on one of the big uh, streaming services. It's called Dope Sick. It stars, stars Michael Keaton. And I know if you remember from the episode with Angela Ardolino, we, but we brought this uh, series up. It. Uh, understandably, yes, it is something that is made for entertainment purposes. However, what it's talking about is real. It is, it has happened. It is continuing to happen and it is continuing to ruin people's lives about opioids. So I, I would highly recommend <laughs> checking that out if you haven't already. I just can't tell you how impactful that series truly is. And Michael Keaton is an incredible actor and he really plays the part well. So anyway, let's get back to Dr. Josie's email. And the reason, again, that I am kind of reading this word for word is one, because I don't want to dilute her message. And two, this is kind of like a sneak peek or teaser, if you will, for the episode coming up where I am going to be interviewing Dr. Josie Buke. So this is like her passion project right now is getting out this information about these drugs that are very unnecessarily being used. Some of them, many, all of them have very serious side effects. Some of them don't even work for what they're being prescribed for. And it's not one of those cases where it's like, well, this is not what it says that it's supposed to do, but we have noticed this what it is what it does. No, 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 no. 
it does not work for what, like there are studies showing that it doesn't work for what it's being prescribed for. So I'm going to let Dr. Josie tell you more of that, but let me continue with her email. What is interesting is the correlation between problems on the human side and the introduction of these same medications to veterinary medicine. My favorite example is the drugs gabapentin. The same year, gabapentin was involved in a $46 billion settlement was the year it first appeared in a veterinary journal editorial suggesting it may be good for neuropathic pain and had minimal to no side effects. It is now one of the most prescribed drugs in veterinary medicine. She has a little asterisk and it says the lawsuit involved the false marketing claim that gabapentin was labeled for neuropathic pain. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. I discovered all of this information from the human medicine world when I went to research the medications that my new patients were being prescribed. I could find very little information about these medications in the veterinary medical literature because there are very few studies that have been done. In fact, for some of them, i.e. gabapentin and trazodone, when searched for on the internet, the same information, nearly word for word, is cut and pasted from article to article. Granted, these articles are meant to inform pet parents, but what is informing veterinarians writing the prescriptions? When searching deeper into the scientific literature, very few, if any, safety or efficacy studies have been performed when it comes to using them in dogs and cats. The ones I did uncover use ambiguous language, ultimately suggesting that more studies need to be performed. Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. The reason I am calling it drug regimens is that patients are usually prescribed not one drug, but multiple medications. The idea is to stack the medications. So for example, a medication is given to block every section of the pain pathway from local receptors to pain fibers to central nervous system receptors. One patient may be taking an anti-inflammatory, IG Rimadel, an opioid, e.g. buprenorphine, methadone, an SSRI antidepressant, uh, e.g. trazodone and gabapentin for a total of four different medications all at the same time. So again, an anti-inflammatory such as Remedil, an opioid such as buprenorphine or methadone, an SSRI antidepressant such as trazodone and gabapentin, is number four, for a total of four different medications at the same time. There are two main categories where I am seeing these meds used. One, anti-anxiety protocols. These are gabapentin, trazodone, Prozac, other SSRIs, benzodiazepines such as Valium, Xanax, Clonopin, among others. And two, the second category, are pain protocols. Opioids including tramadol, methadone, buprenorphine, hydromorphone, combined with gabapentin, amantadine, trazodone, and others, such as good old NSAIDs and steroids. The majority of cases I am seeing are not one or even two of these medications. They are often prescribed up to three, four, or five stacked on top of one another. It is as if no one is considering the synergistic effect of using these drugs together, or rather, a positive spin has been placed upon their synergistic effect claiming greater efficacy is achieved by using multiple drugs while ignoring safety concerns. 
What is not being considered is the fact that combining multiple CNS depressants can be extremely dangerous, leading to respiratory and cardiac depression, quickly leading to death. CNS's central nervous system. This is what is called a drug overdose and why people are warned against combining these medications. When I looked up the medications in the human PDR, I was met with black box suicidal ideation warnings and extensive warnings about combining these different uh, CNS depressants together. Prescribing more than one SSRI antidepressant can lead to something called serotonin syndrome, which can potentially lead to coma and death. And yet dogs are being prescribed long-acting SSRIs like Prozac with the short-acting SSRIs Trazodone and the pain drug Tramadol, which can contribute to serotonin syndrome. Where are these same warnings in the veterinary drug handbook? A few can be found, but to a much more limited extent, partially because the research has not been done on dogs and cats and because dogs and cats cannot communicate their internal experience. Are these drugs even necessary in the average case? I have practiced for over 25 years and before that worked in animal shelters for eight years with highly aggressive dogs undergoing sedation and anesthesia. We never resorted to using these strong, powerful, potentially deadly medications. We used pre-anesthetic mixtures to sedate animals that were very effective without having to have Narcan on hand to prevent an overdose. I have always been mindful regarding pain relief, but have rarely reached for pure mu opioid agnostics, except in extreme cases, i.e. severe trauma, bone fractures, and orthopedic and neurologic surgeries, not extending for more than a few days at most. So what has changed to necessitate the use of these types of pharmaceutical agents? Are these medications, i.e. trazodone, being used and prescribed by shelters and rescue organizations? If they are, are they under veterinary medical supervision? Are dog trainers recommending the meds without medical, valid medical knowledge or supervision? I'm speaking of trazodone in particular. I have to say, and again, this is just a side note. Um, this is me talking again. As a dog trainer, I do not recommend these things. However, I have seen many dog trainers and people just in group, like social media groups, like Facebook, recommending things um, as strong medications to go talk to your vet to get this medication for your dog. It bothers me so much because they should never be recommending these things. Now, a veterinary behaviorist, sure, if they were going to recommend it because you do have a severe case, that's one thing. But no, as a dog trainer, I absolutely would not recommend that at all. I do have natural alternatives that I do recommend, such as CBD, such as the Thunder Shirt, such as Bach flower essences, such as the Relaxo Pet Bluetooth speaker that plays calming music. There are lots of other things we can do to help our pets. Um, CBD is my go-to, both for anxiety and for pain. Um, but that is, I, I'm not going to tell somebody they need to go to their vet to get these strong medications for their dog. That's not my place. So back to Dr. Josie's email. What effects do these medications have on the brain development of young dogs? This is a complete unknown and may never be established. We do not know these medications affect juvenile humans in more drastic ways than adults. What is the end goal? We also have to ask ourselves as veterinarians and as caretakers of these other species, what is the end goal if the patient requires multiple medications to be comfortable? Will the patient eventually recover from the disease process or are we simply providing palliative care and to what end? Animals cannot complain to their doctors about how the meds are making them feel. They just take the piece of cheese with the pill inside of it and swallow it to get the tasty treat. What about the internal experience, mental and emotional, of our patients? Our patients cannot talk and complain about side effects. They do not have the opportunity or the capability to give consent when it comes to taking pills and receiving injections. Furthermore, they do not have the ability to communicate any discomfort 
or troubling mental or emotional side effects they may be feeling internally from the meds. I always ask myself, how would I feel with this treatment on these medications? If I were a dog, would I want to lay around drugged up all day long? Do dogs and cats experience withdrawal symptoms, addiction? Just some things to think about and for which we may never have the answers. So in her email, she does have two case studies that she shares. Uh, I'm going to let her discuss those in more detail in the episode coming up. Um, so I'm going to move to her final thoughts for the email. Why has the use of these potent medications suddenly become necessary in the practice of veterinary medicine? Who is creating and recommending these treatment protocols to veterinarians? I attempted to find out the answer to these questions. I believe a part of the answer lies within the corporate buyout of veterinary medicine and the larger role that big business and big pharma have to play within the profession. They are remodeling veterinary medicine to look like the broken and corrupt human medical industry, insurance companies included. I discovered a nonprofit veterinary association focused on pain relief the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. They are behind the pain management tracks of many continuing education conferences. Upon reading the biographies of the board of directors, I discovered the president is working on several projects with the FDA and the executive director is employed by Pfizer. It is becoming more imperative than ever for pet parents to take a more active role in the medical advocacy of their pets, just as it is in human medicine. Search out second opinions. Educate yourself on the side effects and alternative medications and treatments. Ask questions, and if you do not receive answers, seek care elsewhere. My intention for calling attention to the issue is to open the discussion between veterinarians, pet parents, dog trainers, rescue organizations, and everyone else involved in the animal care field. We all need to do the best that we can for the animals under our care. Thank you, Dr. Josie Buke. And at the end, it says, thank you for reading Musings of an Animal Doctor. This post is public, so feel free to share it to help educate other animal lovers, uh, which is exactly what I am doing. And again, I, I wanted to share this with you, one, as a teaser, because Dr. Josie is coming on the podcast soon, and I'm so excited for that episode. But two... Because it is a problem and because we as pet parents need to be aware. Um, I, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, uh, but we're getting ready to announce something really, really cool. If you're not following me, I will post about it on uh, the podcast here. But if you're not following me on Instagram or Facebook, please do so uh, November 24th. First, 2022, we will be posting a little teaser and we have something really, really cool coming to you December 6th, 2022. And uh, I say we because it's a collaboration project with myself and two other pet parents and pet, pet professionals. I don't know why I'm having a hard time saying pet today, but um, it's really cool. And there is one particular project that you're going to have access to and not too long in the future um, that where we're going to be talking to different veterinarians about cultivating a relationship between veterinarians and pet parents. And this ties into that so well. Yeah, it's just so important to have good communication and open dialogue with your veterinarian, a mutual respect for one another, um, where you both understand that you have very valuable and vital roles as part of a team um, of healthcare providers and caregivers for your pets. And those roles are different but both very valuable and very vital. Um, and this is just one thing. It's actually really scary to me to think that I could take my dog or my cat into the veterinarian's office 
and they could give my pet something so harmful thinking they're doing the right thing. And ultimately my pet could die because of it. Um, I'm tearing up a little bit. So anyway, thank you, Dr. Josie, for putting this incredibly important information out into the world and encouraging us as pet professionals to share it, to help educate others. And I'm so looking forward to having Dr. Josie on the podcast. Let me know what you think about this topic by reaching out to me on Instagram or Facebook. It certainly is scary for me. So um, I, I'm wondering how it makes you feel. With that, I'm going to end today's podcast episode and say thank you for being here. Please share the podcast. If you're not already following the podcast, please do so and rate it. I would appreciate that so much because that is how we can get this show out to more pet parents and help more pets and their parents like you. That's the goal. Give your pets some extra love from me today. And until next week, bye guys. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, 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 oh.